Next up to the stage is Yvonne. Uh, Yvonne from Control Plane. Really, really looking forward to to um, to to your your talk. We got a lot of energy and folks uh, excited to hear from you. So take it away. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can you see it properly? Good. Um, so let's start. Well, thank you for having me. Today, we're going to talk about the security benefits from adopting GitOps. Um, my name is Ivan Petrazas. I'm head of engineering at Control Plane. We are a small consultancy in London. We focus in DevSecOps. And we, we aim to basically secure all the cloud native no landscape is too, is too big. <laughs> we try to, to secure some of the cloud native landscape. Um, 2017, Caligula read Alexis Richardson, coined the term GitOps. He missed the opportunity of shifting left at that moment with a proper name that contains more security in the term. However, I understand that. It was not as catchy as GitHub. So let's see what we can do. Let's talk about journeys. I like it. it's, it's, it's all about journeys here. Um, so let's talk about my journey, right? I live in a small town called Foxton. It's by Dover. And how do you go from Foxton to London? Well, Google Maps to the rescue. You, you go to the station. You get the train, go to St. Pancras, and you have a plethora of options depending where you're going. Tube, bus, walking, electric scooters. H how do you do it safely? That's because my background is development and architecture. And when I joined Control Plan, we're still just facing all the, how, how to do the same things, but, but securely, safely. Secure and safe is slightly different concepts, right? But <clears throat> let's say, Let's see if you can spot the risk in this in these four four tours. Like we have four snapshots of London on the parking lot and spot spot the risks. Okay. Yeah. What about now? And and this is something that is very important to understand. It depends on who you are and where you are. The same thing can be, you know, as not as pleasant as. That's for me, for example, no. male, 46 year old, an empty carriage, please. We, we all have seen the images of empty tube stations in London with some people who had a bit too much to drink or empty streets or even a foggy, dark parking lot, right? It's like, for me, that's, that's okay. For my wife, it's it's probably very different, and that's the difference between between safe and secure, right? Because safety is about context, and and it's very important to understand that what it might be safe for me might not be safe for you. So it's not so much about what do you do; it's what do you do and how do you do it and who do you do it with and and when do you do it and and where and stuff like that right so i'll give you an example my my daughter does gymnastics and she can do backflips can you do a backflip i cannot right but but imagine that you could do a backflip and say okay i need you to come to my company and do a backflip say so, yeah no problem do it now right it's very different to do it in this in this environment or to do it in, in what you had in mind maybe in your gym etc so it's always important to understand the context so how, how do we do it? How do we go from, from getting a system and trying to, to identify the risk and, and, and solve, change the architecture, change the processes? How do we do it? And, and the answer is we threat model the system, right? And what is threat modeling? Well, Wikipedia to the rescue. It's, it's basically an approach to identify threats, right? Um, as I said, my background, building stuff, to a certain degree, building things are easy, but building things safely, it's much harder, particularly if you don't have common sense, like this chap here. But hey, as I said, 
take away from this talk safety is about context. Um, there's, there's an explanation about, about fluid modeling and, and, and how to do it. And, and one of the things that we do is, is to create a type trace. But um, the threat modeling in reality is, is a way of bringing everybody together and trying to have a common language, right? So now all the teams share the same language to describe different things, right? We try to identify patterns and reduce them to, to be able to tackle the, the threats, right? Because threats do not apply just to a team, it's basically company-wide. Um, there's a book, Threat Modeling, and it's very good. And it, it asks questions like this, like what are you building? What could go wrong? How can we avoid these things? And then reflection, like did we, did we do a good job? Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, of course we do. <clears throat> so attack trees. Um, what, what is an attack tree and, and why it's so powerful? I really like them. Um, attack trees have nothing to do with ends going to war in case that there's any Lord of the Rings fans here, sorry, it's just different. Um, and if you go to this financial user group um, project in the CNCF GitHub, you will find the, the Kubernetes threat modeling. It's a little bit old, it's a few months old, but, but it can give you a good idea of, of the threats, right? Um, so for example, let's take this one, right? Like malicious code in a workload and code in workload, we have the, the keys here and this is this is the goal, right? And and how you can achieve this? Well, you have the whole tree here. But let's focus on this little bit here, right? Image. Um let's 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 focus on this in this box here, right? And like if you remember about 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 the tree, this is basically one of the branches. Can we can we do something to to mitigate the threat in this branch? <clears throat> the evil branch. Um, but the answer is yes. And uh, this, this is a much wider problem. Like what we're doing is, is, is trying to solve the supply chain issue or threats in the supply chain. My supply chain is any code that ends up in, in production, right? It's like from writing it to building it and then deploying it. Um, this is the, the life cycle if you want to take it like that. And, and there's something interesting in GitOps is that we break completely this, this workflow. And like now, now we separate completely CI from CD. And this is important because we go from having a very big tree as the one that I had in the slide to have a plethora of small, smallish trees, right? And, and why is this important? Because I, I, like, I will agree that, that the threats Right now are exactly the same thing, just, you know, you just decompose a problem. But we, we have learned that decomposition is important and, and good, right? We have issues that we solve with microservices and, and et cetera. So this, this is a pattern that works very well. We separate, we, we break down a problem and it becomes easier to manage and fix, right? And then this person can, can address the threat in this tree and, and, you know, minimize it, right? So, GitHub separates CI and CD. And this is, and this is huge. Like at the end of the day, CI and CD is something very new. In, in 2008, it was in Toyota and we were just um, running Hudson that became Jenkins, right? So that, that was not that long ago, 12 years. I'll, I'll, I'll take us <laughs> not that long ago. Um, so now we have CI, which is basically artifact life cycle and we have CD, which is application life cycle and slightly different, right? So why, why we say that GitOps <coughs> out of the path is more secure? First thing is that there's no need for external users to access the cluster, or at least to be able to schedule workloads in the cluster, right? And the second big thing is about, you can enforce a lot of policy and you can do a lot of reviews before the code is, is, is consumed by the operator, right, by the flux. Um, you can check that it's compliant, it has the right configuration. And we have got very good at creating artifacts and, and CRD as a Helm release, for example, is a better example. And like you, you can publish a Helm chart that is compliant and, and then you just consume that as a 
as an authorized package. <clears throat> Another thing very important is the user management, right? Like in particular in GitHub, we have a, a, a much higher granularity. We can have organizations, we have groups, teams, projects, we can create um, protected branches, right? So the fact that someone compromises our repo and, and adds some dodgy YAML file does not mean that, that the production has been compromised, right? Because we still have the pull requests and review processes. And if everything goes wrong, we have the audit, right? Um, it's important to understand that work, workload management happens in Git now, not, not in the cluster, right? So you can go and, and see what's scheduled in the cluster and what's going to be scheduled in the cluster. And the other thing is that managing exceptions become a cluster concern. It's easier to work in this way, um, creating the, the right hierarchy of, of objects when you're working in GitHub, when you have environments like production, development, test, et cetera. And, and what, is, what is a resource that belongs to the environment? What is a resource that belongs to the classes? And what is a resource that belongs to the application? It takes a while for people to figure out, but, but it's part of this journey, right? So maybe it's for a different kind of talk. But, but there's something very important and interesting how you, how you address all these concerns. <clears throat> what about secrets? Because people always ask me about secrets. Um, the, the best advice I can give you is do not put them in Git. Yes, you have sealed secrets, you have Git grip, you can do blah, blah, blah. But at the end, you have to promise now you have secrets and you have key management. And if you think that key management is an easy problem to solve, well, we'll just say GPG. <laughs> It, it is not trivial, right? it's, it's, it's quite hard. So don't do it, put them in, in VOLT, put them in all the tools that you have available that will allow you to manage the secrets. Um, remember that secrets are data, right? You will not put the, the tamp of a database in your, in your GitHub repo. So that's, that's my advice. Um, and remember the, the weakest link, you are as strong as your weakest link. Um, I don't remember if I flip my skin or not, but I'm more like kind of on the right, not on the left. But if if I flip the screen and all of a sudden I'm Captain America, hey, <laughs> good for me. Um, I'm not. So this is what is a chain link. I just wanted to to show how these things are made. Is is very manual, big chains, big links. Move on. So supply chain. We have. Oh, four minutes. Um, we have all these parts that, that all these aspects that we touched on. Right? Like this is about writing the artifact. This is about defining and, and promoting my application. Right? This is the separation, the, the, the great separation we have between CI and CD. Supply chain. This is all the all the things that you should think about when you have to protect and make the supply chain um, more secure. Hopefully, you got the screenshot. I'll put the, the slides available on Twitter and I'll send them to the week guys as well. So you will have this. Um, so yeah, let's, let's look at, at a few things. For example, the Docker file, right? One of the things that we do in the Docker file is have a multi-stage Docker file that does a whole bunch of stuff. Like the first thing to do is, is to run OPA, then we build, we harden the image and then we run unit tests. If the unit test fails, what happens is the build fails. So you don't build a Docker image that doesn't pass your unit test. And at the end, we add metadata. Uh, let's see if I can show you this. I think that I will have to make it a little bigger for you. <clears throat> but here, you can see, so we run conf test and a few um, of a config slash the frigo files and we build, we harden. And here is where we run the, the tests. We use GOS, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very nice. Because of that, right? Like you just build something that, that passes your test. You can open all the things if you want. Another tool that is super useful is in Toto. This allows you to sign cryptographically you artifacts and make sure that that has been built following the right the right um, processes, and it integrates with Graphias, and and it's one of these things that, that helps a lot to very validate and verify the the supply chain. Um, vulnerability scanning, there's a lot of a lot of products out there that do this. You can do it in the re in the registry. You can do it when you create the 
the Docker image. You can do it when you're running in the cluster. You have different options, right? And this is something that is important to understand. Like in, in, in all these trees, you're like, oh, I have I have trees or I have aqua. That's it, right? Like I, I solved the, the problem. And reality is not is on that because you know, Docker images edge. Um I would I like to think that they edge like fish, more like like cheese, because they can they can get um all very quickly. Another thing that you can you can use is critics is this is a um, admission controller. Now just a word of caution here, critics will will enforce policies and will be very strict. And it, it, the feeling that many people have is that once you put critics, you cannot schedule anything because nothing passes the policies. But um, it is one of the things that that um, it's one of these projects that helps a lot, right? Because now you have gatekeeping at the at the cluster. Um, so this is the, the supply chain, different different products. Docker Hub, we all have heard the news of <laughs> other limitations, but but you can you can go and suggest um thinking about all the different things that you have to put in you and your pipelines to be able to to deploy and run your workloads um, safely. So the important thing here that I want to to enforce is in the deploy aspect, you can do a lot of things now for free. It's, it's not really free, it's, it's a pain. That's where we have all this automation, but you could go and validate that, that the Helm charts are using are, are the ones that they should be, that, that the templates in the Helm charts have the right, you know, liveness probe and readiness probe and the limits and the requests, et cetera. Um, you could do it manually to begin with, but then you can automate it using things like OPA. Um, so it, it it is it is something that enables you to to move faster. Um, summary: Well, threat modeling help you to identify and address the risks of your system, right? And and remember that your system and my system might be different. What what we do in in my company and what you do in your company probably is different. So probably the risks are slightly different. GitHub simplifies hugely the the deployment and managing of the applications. Finally, safety is about context. And then there are things that you can do to protect your cluster if you want. I have more things that you can read later, um, but that's it. Thank you very much. Yvonne, thank you so much for that talk. Very informative. I, I, I love your pictures. I, I love um, you know, your depictions of, 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 of your safety. And 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 doing and doing backflips so <laughs> doing backflips off of a building kept me on my toes there. Kept me on my toes. <laughs> Can you do a backflip? Yeah, I can't. I can't <laughs> join the club. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, uh, you know, uh, uh, my safety and context is, is, is certainly important, right? When when we will feel safe versus when when our wife will feel safe, when a developer will feel safe versus when an operator will feel safe. So exactly that that was the message of, of this term, right? Like, like like think about the others and don't don't just look at your code and say, yeah, yeah, this is all right, like because you know what? Maybe it's not all right for your neighbor. Much appreciated. Much appreciated.